Hello and welcome again. Today we will be covering the chapter number 10 of the history class 6. So previously we have covered the history till 9th chapter. So in this chapter we will be looking at the traders, kings and pilgrims. Before that uh, I would request uh, you to subscribe the channel and also please like the video and share your thoughts and comments about the video and also share these initiatives with your fellow friends and uh, the aspirants right so let us uh, understand the concept of the chapter 10 this uh, chapter talks about the traders and uh, later on it will also talk about the Koshana dynasty and a little bit uh, information about the developments which uh, happened in that period and later on we'll also talk about the Bhakti movement uh, so it has provided the details in brief about all these concepts so let us understand each of them one by one okay. so let's start so it is talking about how to find about the traders uh, trade and traders so as we know that the different trade and trade uh, trades are happening in the different parts of the India right so basically there were the traders which we have already seen uh, that these traders were commencing all these uh, trading activities from the uh, the coastal ports of the India right not only through the sea routes but also from the inland route of the uh, different part of the continent right so we will also understand about the silk route and uh, what was the important and how it came into the prominence so south india was the famous for gold spices especially pepper and the precious stones the paper was particularly valued in roman empire so much so that it was known as black gold in today's economy as we understand that the black gold uh, is called to the oil and petroleum but in the earlier era in the earlier times it was the paper which was given the uh, the value of the black gold right so it times time to time the economy kept on changing and the importance of the values also kept on changing so it happens uh, it happens according to the time that uh, which commodity uh, is is much is in demand for an example at that time uh, black gold or uh, the pepper was important because they need to preserve the food and today if we look at the why petroleum is so important because the economy runs on the completely on most of the uh, like uh, trading of the ships and we, if we talk about the commun uh, the commutation which happens we have cars uh, we have aeroplanes we have different motorbikes so this all have this uh, importance of petrol right so we can say that they in economical part both played an important role and according to that uh, the concept of importance also kept on changing hence the paper was important in that time so it is uh, providing us the information that uh, a poem also have been uh, uh, talking about the trades which were happening in that time so uh, evidences of the trade also been found in the Sang uh, sangam poem so uh, sangam poem so we have already seen that uh, about the sangam literature where it was wrote, uh, written right and uh, why it was called as the sangam uh, literature so in the uh, chapter 9 we have covered it so you can go ahead if you have not watched that video then you can go ahead and watch that and later on you can understand about this portion so let us stand there, understand that what it is referring so in this poem that the it is talking about the goods which brought to the pohar and what is pohar pohar is an important port on the east coast right so if we talk about the indian continent then the east coast uh, which is a uh, like uh, the part of the kerala right so it becomes important uh, th these were the important places like the pohar and the mojiris and the tondi we will talk about these places in detail as well so these were the important places for the trade and trading activities were taking places so what all uh, things were uh, getting exchange or being traded from here like the horses by uh, sea in the ships black papers gems and gold born in himalayas and the sandal boots which were there which was procured from the western hills and the pearls from the south southern seas right and the corals from the eastern oceans 
okay and the yields from the ganga and the crops from the kaveri so it is providing the complete detail from the north to uh, north to south and east to west that uh, what all commodities being procured from the different part of the indian subcontinent and which was which was getting traded from these parts it was also talking about the food stuff from the sri lanka and the pottery from the myanmar so uh, this the important thing for us to understand about the puhar which was an important port in, at the east coast right and the different things which were uh, getting traded so this uh, this thing is this thing is only important for us right it is just to provide the basic understanding that what all things were getting traded in that time and it has also been uh, mentioned in the uh, sangam poem so what traders used to do the traders explored the several sea routes of course if they are trading into the different part of the world so they have to uh, move through the sea routes so definitely they must have traveled to the different uh, ports and the parts of the world right? and it is also mentioning about that which uh, ports and the seas it is referring like the arabian sea bay of bongo uh, bay of bengal where the sailors took advantage of the monsoon winds uh, to the cross the seas from uh, more quickly so uh, yes of course the technology of uh, using the motor boats have come today but earlier time there was uh, no such facility was available so the traders used to have uh, this they used to rely on the uh, advancement of the winds monsoon winds right so how they used to use it let us understand that as well that if they wanted to reach to the it is also providing us the that uh, information also that how they used to travel so let us understand that as well if they wanted to reach to the western coast of the subcontinent from the east africa or arabia they chose to sail with the southwest monsoon so if uh, they wanted for example if they wanted to move from the arabia or uh, east africa right so they used to uh, wait for this uh, southwest monsoon so southwest monsoon uh, used to help them to bring to the subcontinent right if they were traveling from east uh, africa or arabian uh, peninsula so how the new kingdoms uh, along the coast were uh, also taking part into the trades so let us understand that as well the southern uh, half the uh, southern half of the india uh, it has a long uh, coastline and with like it also have hills plateaus river valleys and among the river valleys uh, the kaveri was the most fertile so we will uh, look at the the why it was important because of its fertility it was always a bone of contention between the big different dynasties when we will move into the uh, medieval then uh, we will look and see and understand that uh, who were the dynasties who were fighting for the uh, this particular river valley right so sangam uh, poems also mentioned about the muvendar so it is not referring to a term muvendar so it becomes important for us to pay the attention about the whenever we refer any term so now it is talking about the muvendar so let us understand that uh, what the importance of this terminology muvendar is so this is a tamil word meaning three chiefs right and who were the three chiefs used for the head of the three chiefs uh, let us understand the three chiefs it is referring so muvendars were the cholas cheras and pandyas so these three uh, families or ruling families or the kingdoms became uh, prominent or really important who became uh, powerful in the southern india somewhere around 2300 years ago so let let us understand that the cholas used to rule in the eastern part of the southern india or we can say the, the southeast part of the india and the cheras used to rule in the, uh, the western southwest part of the india and the pandyas used to rule into the proper uh, southern part of the india right so remember this that who was ruling into the which part so we can see that if this is the it is not the best uh, map but still we can understand so this part for the pandyas right and uh, this part for the cholas and here the cheras right so we can understand in this manner as well so each of uh, the three chiefs uh, who had like these two centers uh, and like these we talked about these three uh, <coughs> powers which were there so they had control of 
the two parts inland and the coastal areas so so it becomes the six cities and the two were very important out of these six so we have already talked about the puhar let us understand uh, the why these were important so puhar also known as the kaveri patina uh, it was the port of the cholas and the madurai was the capital of the pandya so we have already seen that the madurai uh, which was the capital of pandyas where the sangam literature was written we have already seen this in the previous uh, chapter and the puhar we just saw that the pohar was important because most of the trading uh, activities were taking place from this particular port and was important port for cholas so remember two things like for cholas the pohar or the kaveri patna was the important port and for the uh, pandyas madurai was the capital right and uh, what important thing was happened here in the madurai so remember that as well because sometimes the straight forward question can be asked that uh, where the uh, the sangam literature was uh, written or were in the uh, ancient indian uh, in the uh, reference to the ancient india the puhar refers to what so there could be multiple options and uh, among them the port will be the one option so remember this right the chiefs did not collect the regular taxes instead they demanded and receiving the gift from the people so they were not collecting the taxes rather the, they had uh, like they instead they demanded and they used to receive the gift from the people and they also went on the military expeditions so of course why they were taking the military expedition so these kings always uh, used to go for these type of uh, uh, wars and battles to show their uh, power not only power they also used to after defeating to the nearest kingdom or the neighboring king they used to collect the huge amount of uh, uh, war booty from these kings or kingdoms or they used to collect the money from the uh, religious institutions or prosper states so this was the purpose so that uh, they can not only extend their uh, boundaries but also uh, bring the prosperity to their own kingdom so this was the purpose so it was always related to, uh, to the polity and to the economy as well so they kept some of the wealth and distributed the rest amongst their supporters including members of their family soldiers and poets so this was happening because they wanted to keep uh, these people happy so they kept on uh, providing their support to the king so around 200 years later a dynasty known as satvahanas so here we are referring about the satvahanas uh, became powerful in the western india most of the important ruler like the most important ruler of the satvana dynasty uh, was the gautamiputra satkar sri satkarni and uh, an inscription has also been found which was inscribed uh, on the behalf of uh, uh, gautamiputra sri satkarni uh, by his mother gautami balashri so remember this name that who uh, got inscribed the inscription on the behalf of gautamiputra sri satkarni her mother Oh, like his mother gautami balashri remember this so he and other satvahana rulers were also known as the lord of the dakshinapad so it can also be asked as a preliminary question that uh, who used to be known as the uh, lord of the dakshinapad so it was the satvahana ruler satvahana ruler so they called themselves as the uh, lords of the dakshinapad right so keep remember this that uh, who who was the important dynasty uh, which came after the 200 years after the chola chera pandya were ruling right so it was the satvana dynasty and among them uh, who was the most important ruler it was gautami putra shri satkarni right so now, now let us understand about the silk route which we were referring that uh, why it is called known as the silk route so uh, prior to that let us understand about the raw what is uh, silk and how it is procured so raw silk has to be extracted from the cocoon of silk worm and spun into a thread and then woven into a cloth so it is clearly providing us with the information that uh, raw silk has to be extracted from a cocoon of silk worm so it is a silk worm from uh, which uh, this uh, raw silk has to be procured and later on it is spun into a thread and woven into a cloth so that is how it was like uh, the people who were into the business of uh, making silk clothes they used to uh, made the clothes 
for the different kings and uh, they used to not only uh, uh, used to sell into the internet trade but also you uh, were sending to the uh, distant places of the world like the roman uh, empire was also very much interested of purchasing these silk clothes right and uh, of course the uh, india was very rich that time so indian uh, indian kings also used to procure these silk uh, clothes right so techniques of making silk were first invented in china around 7000 years ago so this fact becomes important because straightforward question can be asked that uh, the technique of making the silk clothes or the making silk were in, first invented in which part of the world so it was china where the somewhere around 7100 year, 7000 years ago this particular technology was developed right and some of the people from the china who went to the distant land on foot horseback on camel and carried silk with them the paths they followed came to be known as the silk road so of course for an example if here is china right and if the chinese people are traveling to the uh, roman empire or to the india or uh, the other part of the world so whatever the way they were following so this particular route was came to known as the silk route right so they were not only traveling on the foot but also carried uh, uh, like uh, they uh, they were also carrying their uh, things on the horseback camels were there because the latest technology was not developed so of course these were the only ways available to them hence uh, they carried all these stuff uh, the silk material through uh, these routes and hence this particular route was known as silk route right so in later developments we will also understand that uh, the different branches of the silk route also developed and uh, the actively the kings and kingdoms tried to uh, have the control on these particular paths why because they wanted to uh, not only uh, provide the protection but also they wanted to gain the uh, huge amount of money by taxing these routes so we will understand that as well so about 2000 years ago wearing silk became the fashion among the ruler and rich people in the room so yes of course we understand as the trade was uh, improving so uh, the prosperity of the kings and kingdoms were uh, gradually increasing so they also wanted to uh, show their lavish life and uh, of course they'll provide that uh, type of uh, uh, additional value to their life that uh, they are rich and uh, of course this type of it became a fashion and uh, definitely rome was also growing that time so since we have the evidences that not only india but the china also was uh, uh, heavily trading with the roman empire so of course they were very rich in this regard right so it became a fashion and uh, hence they used to purchase uh, these silk uh, clothes from the uh, Chinese part and the Chinese trader used to deliver these clothes to Roman Empire right? and the other people who were there who were living in the these uh, kingdoms so some kings tried to control as we were talking about that uh, why it was important to control the uh, silk route so here it has provided into the details so let us understand this as well so some kings tried to control the large portion of the route this was because now it is also providing us the region so understand the region why and uh, why most of the fights or uh, control of the trade happens because of the uh, not only for the political reason but for the economical reason is also it happens so it is providing the economical reasons so this was because the, they could benefit from the taxes tributes and gifts that were brought by the traders traveling along the route in return they often uh, protected the traders who were passing through their kingdoms from attacks or by robbers so uh, of course we understand that if uh, traders moving from the china to rome it is a long way uh, whether on the foot or whether on the camel or the horseback of course they needed a, a protection of uh, their uh, belongings or the things which they were carrying if they have sold the their things then they must be carrying the money right so it should be protected otherwise somebody there was always a threat of uh, getting robbed by different people or uh, in the different kingdom or different areas so thugs were always there hence uh, they also had a good relation with the kings and uh, uh, so that they also provided with the protection and in return they used to provide them the amount uh, they used to share some amount to the king so not only it used to provide the prosperity to, uh, to the people who were selling but also add the prosperity to the kings and kingdoms as well right so the best known uh, 
of the rulers who control the silk route were the Kushanas. So we will understand about the Kushanas in detail. But here in brief, uh, it, the pro information has been provided that the Kushanas were also tried to control. Earlier we have also seen that uh, the Kushana rulers um, made the Mathura as the, the second capital and they also controlled the, uh, this because Mathura was on the center, uh, which we earlier understood that uh, from the west to east, uh, west to east and from north to south the, there was a path right so it was and uh, here was the mathura so th they tried to control this part because uh, it was becoming more prosper since the people were crossing and traders were moving from the different parts right so it became an important uh, city in terms of trade and traders and trading right the kushanas who ruled over the central asia and northwest india around 2000 years ago so it is providing us with the area that where did they rule they ruled the central asia and the northwestern part of the india somewhere around 2000 years ago there are two major uh, centers of the power were the peshawars and the mathura and uh, in the previous class uh, we just took uh, we understood that uh, why mathura was important now it is also providing us with the information that uh, the peshawar was uh, equally important for them Right? And the Takshila was also included in their kingdom. So we have seen in uh, the uh, last chapters that the Takshila at uh, some time, uh, sometimes uh, uh, like uh, in the uh, modern empire, uh, Takshila, Ashoka was the governor of the Takshila for a prominent time. Right? And it, was, it played an important role for the uh, modern period as well. And Takshila remained important since uh, it was not only on the roots of the uh, like uh, the silk route right so it remained to touch of the northwestern part of the india as well right so all the trade and tradings uh, were happening so it was continuously became an important center of these things as well hence the taxila becomes important so during the their rule a branch of silk route so it is now also which the thing which we were referring that the different uh, branches were got developed uh, as uh, the kings and kingdoms also spread so during their rule, a branch of silk route extended from the Central Asia down to the seaports at the mouth of river Indus. So now it is providing us the information that uh, from where to where this particular route was extended. So understand this, this route was extended from Central Asia to down to the mouth of the river Indus. right? And uh, from where the silk was shipped westward to the Roman Empire. So. Uh, the traders who were taking uh, the silk material from the China, they used to take this item till the Indus River and from there it used to shift to the westwards to the Roman Empire. Right. So it not only adding prosperity to the China, but also providing the adding the prosperity to the Indian subcontinent as well. The Kushanas were among the earliest ruler of the subcontinent to issue gold coins. So remember this uh, particular fact. It is really important that why Kushanas uh, are really important as the ruler of the India, uh, of the Indian subcontinent and the northwestern part and uh, also they rule till the Mathura. So why? The end not only why but they also issued the gold coins. Right? So now let us uh, talk about the spread of Buddhism that uh, how along with the trade and trading activities uh, since we understood that uh, how traders subscribe uh, traders subscribe to the Buddhism and how it was uh, getting to the prominence as a religion in that time. So it is also providing us the uh, details of that time but in brief not in detail. So we will understand in the later chapter as well. But uh, just to provide with the information that uh, this is the way of reading the NCERT that uh, you break down uh, the important things and also try to understand that how it is related to not only with the polity but also the economic portion and the social things as well. Right? Uh, because the religion is always related to the uh, polity, social and uh, also always uh, we, it was also the center of the economic uh, things as well. So not only here, but uh, in the later time also, it will uh, religion will play an important role. Where we will see that the big temples uh, emerged and how they uh, contributed uh, into the uh, different economic activities, right? So let us understand this. So the most famous Kushana ruler was Kanishk. 
So most famous uh, Kushana ruler was Kanish. So Kanish, remember this. So who ruled about uh, somewhere around 1900 years ago, and he organized a Buddhist council. Which Buddhist council? He he uh, organized the fourth Buddhist council near Kashmir. Remember this. So this uh, information was not provided in detail. So I have just provided a very uh, brief information here. Later on, uh, in the other chapters, uh, the detailed information has been provided, and the, the, there we will understand uh, these concept, uh, these concept in detail as well. Right? So, Ashoghosa, a poet uh, who composed a biography of Buddha, and uh, what was the name of this biography? Buddha Charitra. So now understand that the Ashoghosa was a poet and uh, who written a biography, who composed a biography of. Uh, Buddha named Buddha Charitra was the name of this book. Uh, who used to live in the court of Kanishka? So Ashwagosa and the other Buddhist scholars now began to writing in Sanskrit. So now understand that uh, with the beginning of uh, the uh, different uh, how the languages also get changed. So earlier we have seen uh, seen that uh, the uh, Ashoka was uh, writing his uh, inscriptions in the uh, Prakrit language and same was uh, getting done by the uh, Mahavir, right? So he was preaching in the uh, like the Mahavir wa was uh, uh, preaching in the Pali and Prakrit language, and Buddha was also pre uh, preaching in the Prakrit language to address the masses. So how the how these things or the language uh, evolves? So here we will understand that once again. Once again, Sanskrit became the prominent language, right? And the Buddhist monks also, rather than the uh, uh, they left, uh, not left, but also uh, ap apart from writing in the Prakritic language, they started uh, writing in the Sanskrit as well, right? So here, uh, the Buddhist one branch of Buddhism, like in the Fourth Council, what happened that uh, the two branches uh, got divided. Uh, or we can say that the Buddha, uh, the Buddhism got divided into the two parts, two branches. One was the uh, Mahayan and the other was the Hinayan. So Mahayan, as the name indicates, Maha means big, Yana means vehicle. So the Mahayan in totality can be called as the greater vehicle, whereas the uh, Hinayan is known as the lesser vehicle. So we will understand that why lesser vehicle and the greater vehicles, these uh, branches were called. So this dividation happened in the fourth council. Right? The, the purpose of the council was to resolve the dispute. So let us understand this as well here. So the, the councils which prior to the first, so first, second, third councils were also happened. So we will talk about them. In the later portion but uh, in the fourth portion so the purpose of the councils was there that uh, they always wanted to provide some the information and also noted down the important rule books and other things but also used to uh, resolve the disputes of the different se uh, sects of the buddhism itself right so this was the purpose and they use or uh, they used to discuss the different matters of uh, the dhamma or dharmas or uh, different things related to the buddhist so this was the purpose of these councils so here uh, in the fourth council what happened that the two branches developed hinayana and mahayana so we have already uh, looked at the mahayana buddhist so what is providing in the yellow uh, paragraph so let us understand that as well the earlier the buddha's provisions was known in the sculptures and by using the certain signs for instance his attainment of enlightenment was shown by the sculpture of people tree so this fact become really important because as a question it can be asked that in uh, hinayana uh, buddhism that how uh, buddha's attainment of enlightenment was represented it was represented through a people tree and why so because uh, it is said that the buddha got the or the attained the enlightenment after he started uh, meditating uh, below a people tree right so that is why uh, it is represented by a people tree right so now let us understand the 
other concepts as well so now the statues of buddhas were made so uh, what is it talking about so it is talking about the mahayan buddhism that uh, how it uh, changed so now the statues of buddhas were made and many of these were made in mathura while the other were made in taxila so we will understand that as well if you will look here uh, that the beautiful inscription has been made right okay? so so let us understand that uh, since we have already understood that the mathura and uh, takshila and uh, the peshawar were the important uh, location or the these uh, were the important uh, places for the uh, kushana rulers right so here the mathura school of art developed right in mathura and not only here but it also inspired the gandhara school of art and the some features of the uh, by mixing the mathura school of art and some features of the gandhara school of art we will see that how it uh, uh, it gave the uh, birth of the different type of uh, art and architectures and different statues of the buddha also uh, got developed in this period right so now it is talking about the bodhisattvas so who were the bodhisattvas bodhisattva was a person who had attained the enlightenment and once they attained the enlightenment they could live in complete isolation and meditated in peace however instead of doing that they remain in the world to teach and help other people and worship of bodhisattvas became very popular and spread through central asia china and later to uh, korea and japan so bodhisattvas were the people so they could like after attaining the uh, uh, enlightenment they could live in complete isolation or uh, they can leave this world right but instead they what they chose they remained in this world to teach the other people they wanted to help the other people to attain the uh, to uh, not only attain but the understand the philosophy of buddha right so in uh, in that term they help the other people as well to understand the philosophy of buddha and to attain the buddha ship or type of uh, uh, understanding because there are the different concept of uh, uh, of in buddhism like arhat uh, or uh, bodhisattvas and the, we will also understand the concept of uh, manjushri and uh, avalokiteshwara right so we will understand all these terminology later the worship of bodhisattva became popular where uh, these were the part like central asia china korea and japan as well so here uh, we were talking about the uh, gandhara school of art and the mathura school of art so these images have been shown so i will let you understand so below left an image of buddha from the mathura and the right an image from the uh, buddha from the takshila so you will understand uh, the basic difference so here this image is a part of the Uh, gandhara school of art and this image is a part of the mathura school of art so here uh, in if you will pay close attention then the mathura school of art was getting developed at that time and uh, hence uh, you will not see that uh, the there will be uh, it will be little bit crude but if you will look at the gandhara school of art at the right hand side then you will look at the uh, like the the drapes are there like right? and uh, the different features of buddha which are different from the mathura school of art right so they also started showing the buddha as a god right and the different features we will understand in detail right when we will uh, go into the depth or we will uh, start the uh, ncert of 12th class so then we will understand or prior to that we will see if uh, there will be any chapters which pair the it has been talked about the uh, different arc and art and architecture then we will look into the different uh, aspects of the architecture and the arts of uh, buddha school this uh, mathura school of art and the uh, gandhara school of art okay so let us move ahead so buddhism also spread uh, no, spread to the south east parts to sri lanka myanmar thailand and also other part of southeast asia including indonesia the older form of buddhism known as theravada buddhism so remember this the, the older form of buddhism is known as theravada buddhism and was more popular in which parts in the myanmar thailand sri lanka southeast asia indonesia right 
right so here a cave has been shown so earlier we have understood that uh, what was the purpose of the monasteries and the caves so that the nuns or uh, the monks could recite right so a cave of uh, karle in maharashtra has been shown here right so now it is talking about the pilgrims that the different people and uh, the travelers or the uh, they used to take the different journeys along with them the pilgrims of all travel uh, also travel with them right so what is the pilgrims these are the men and women who undertook the journey to the holy places and today also we see that uh, uh, some people go to the take the path of uh, like uh, ganga right and uh, some people visit to the hajj do the hajj so these are the different important uh, areas of worship they used to go in that time as well all these prominent areas which were there right so in different times uh, different areas of uh, religious uh, religious importance always come into the existence and hence people always try to visit them to uh, seek the blessings of the god and goddesses so chinese buddhist uh, buddhist pilgrims like the fahian who came to the subcontinent about uh, 1600 years ago and uh, yun sang who came somewhere around 1400 years ago and uh, ai king who came somewhere around 50 years after the yun sang right so these were the people re remember the name who were the people and uh, what time they visited to the india so fahian was there yun sang was there ai king was there Like right? and uh, uh, they would travel sixteen hundred, fourteen hundred, and thirteen hundred fifty T. Right. So these were the pe uh, people who visited, and why visited? They wanted to understand about the Buddhism, because uh, any pilgrim always wanted to understand about his god or uh, the goddesses. Right. So uh, there there are the accounts which mention about the the journey of the fahian that how he uh, returned back to the uh, china so fahian uh, began his journey from the back from bengal from the sea uh, using a ship right so he got stuck in a storm so this is not important uh, for us but i have seen a question uh, asked in the pcs that uh, once the fahian was returning and uh, he stuck into the uh, this storm then where he took the uh, where he stayed so he stayed in java and he stayed there for the like uh, it took uh, more than 90 days to reach the java where he stood for 5 months right so before uh, leaving from the uh, java once again for the china so he stayed in java so remember this part only so yuan zheng took uh, the uh, land route so we have already seen that the fayan took the uh, sea route whereas the yuan zheng took the land route back to the china northwestern part of uh, central through northwestern part and the central asia and carried back with him the statues of uh, buddha made of uh, gold silver and sandalwood so these were the things uh, which he carried with himself and apart from the 600 manuscripts also he took from here right so all these things uh, must have helped them to understand about the more in depth uh, of the the buddha philosophy and uh, must have helped them to understand the buddhism in detail and uh, how indian uh, uh, rulers were also helping the these uh, religion different religion right so this must have provided the detailed information right so let us understand about the nalanda a unique center of buddhism learning so yun zheng studied in nalanda this only this part is important for us and the most famous buddhist monastery of that period uh, is in nalanda which is in bihar so a paragraph has been uh, taken from the uh, writings of the yun uh, yun zheng so it provides us the information about that how the teachers are the men and of the highest ability it is providing us the detail that the uh, these people uh, these people who were the teacher were the very able people right they follow the teachings of buddha in all sincerity uh, the rules of the monastery are strict and everyone has to follow them the discussions are held throughout the day so like the buddhist discussions or the religious discussions were happening in the, that time in this this particular monastery and the old and the young mutually help each other so this uh, we also see in the indian culture today as well and uh, they learn from the 
men of different cities come here to settle their doubts like people if having any doubts they also came here and uh, they clarified their doubts the gatekeepers ask new entrant difficult questions so it becomes important like uh, it was uh, some sort of uh, entrance exam uh, they are allowed to enter only after they have been able to answer these questions so this, this is uh, some sort of uh, preliminary exams so seven or eight uh, out of every ten are not able to answer so only understand that how difficult uh, these questions or these exams would have been in that era as well so only three two to three people were all uh, getting selected into the monastery and seven to eight people were uh, being rejected right so today the uh, the institutions we see such as the upsc and the other institutions who uh, conduct the examination though similar to like uh, uh, these type of uh, facility or the, these type of institutions were also there in that time so the beginning of the bhakti movement so bhakti movement how it started and what is the meaning of uh, bhakti we will understand in this particular chap uh, the portion so what is bhakti this was also uh, the time when the worship of certain deities which uh, became a central feature of later hinduism gained in importance right shiva vishnu and the goddess such as durga came into the existence uh, uh, and the like these were there but uh, uh, the most now the importance were given earlier because we have seen that uh, how the uh, previous time uh, in the uh, harappa civilization what type of uh, religion uh, they were following later on that what type of religion developed and now uh, we have seen that the shiva vishnu and uh, goddess durga became important and these deities were worshiped through bhakti and idea uh, that became very popular at this time so bhakti became really uh, important and why it became important or uh, popular because anybody could follow the path of bhakti there was uh, no uh, difference between the rich or poor or the high or low caste see the bhakti was about all of them right or all these things so it is now talking about the bhakti that uh, bhakti emphasized, emphasized uh, devotion and the individual worship of the god and goddesses rather than the performance of elaborate sacrifices so we like uh, in the early vedic period or the later vedic period uh, in the like uh, in later vedic period the dominance of uh, sacrifices was there right but uh, in uh, bhakti what uh, they were uh, paying more like uh, more importance it was the uh, devotion rather than uh, sacrifices if a person is devoted toward the deity then definitely is going to uh, see him or get the going to get the blessings of the his deity or her deity right uh, but there was uh, no ideology of uh, sacrifice after sacrifices you will be blessed or right or the deity will uh, uh, will be pleased this concept was not there in the bhakti so what is now it is uh, providing us the definition of bhakti that it comes from the sanskrit word or uh, terms bhaja meaning to div, uh, divide or share this suggests that an intimate two way relationship between the deity and the devotee so there was no third way like uh, it was clear cut two way relationship between deity and devotee it was a direct path right and uh, sacrifices had no no role to play bhakti is direct towards the bhagavat and which is often translated as god but also meant uh, one who possess the and share the bhaga literally god uh, fortune or bliss the devotee known as uh, the bhakta or bhagavata so this is important that uh, the uh, devotees also uh, known as the bhakta or bhagavata so today also we call that the bhakta or bhagavata right and the bhagavat concept is also uh, dominant in uh, today's world as well in hinduism right so a poem of uh, bhakta has also been uh, provided here like the now we just uh, do not need to uh, go through the poem but uh, we just need to pay the attention on a name that Appar, a devotee of Shiva. He was who was the Appar? Appar was the devotee of Shiva, right? Who lived about the fourteen hundred years ago, and Appar was a Velala. So uh, in the previous chapter, we understood that uh, three type of uh, prevalent people were living into this uh, South India and also in the North India. So once you will uh, watch that video, you will understand this term as well, right? So this is 
this is just a reference about the bhakta in the uh, poem so we do not need to understand all this uh, paragraph just the important name and uh, uh, this devotee was devoted towards the like who was the devotee of this uh, he was the devotee upper was the devotee of shiva right so the deity was shiva and devotee was upper because the deity were the special these images of uh, deity were often placed within the special homes and the places that we described as temples so the concept of uh, temples started emerging from this time that uh, if there is a deity which is of uh, importance to the people of a certain community of uh, right so then they must have uh, made a special home for the deity out of love right so it uh, started uh, getting the uh, or the initial developments of the temple started happening in this time and later on we will see that the elaborate concept of the temples that how uh, the different temples developed right and uh, what was their contribution we will understand that as well so it is providing us with the definition of hindu the word hindu like the term india is uh, derived from the river indus it was used by the arabs so who used it used by arabs and the iranians to the refer the people who live to the east of the river and the culture practice including religious belief so all those people who were living to the east of the indus they were uh, called as hindus so that time uh, there was uh, no religious differences but rather uh, Uh, the arabs and the iranian called to the people who were living to the east of the indus they called them hindus uh, no matter what uh, caste what religions they were belonging they simply called them hindus right so what was happening into the different part of the world about 2000 years ago christianity emerged in west asia and the jesus christ was born in bethlehem right Bethlehem, uh, which was then the part of the Roman Empire. So remember this: that the Bethlehem uh, was the part of Roman Empire, and uh, somewhere around two thousand years ago, uh, Jesus Christ was born, and he uh, taught to people to treat uh, treat others with the love and trust others, just as they themselves wanted to be treated. So uh, the philosophy was very uh, clear and simple: that treat others with love and trust. as you would want to uh, get treated by the others simple so christ's teaching appeal to the ordinary people and spread through the west asia africa and europe so it is spread to the west asia africa and europe the first christian preacher came from the west asia to the west coast so we have already understood the west coast means the uh, the indian continent which is kerala right uh, within the 100 years of the uh, death of Uh, jesus christ the christians of the kerala known as syrian christians so remember this that the kerala christians are known as syrian christians because they probably came from the west asia and are amongst the oldest christian community in the world right so this development or all these developments were happening parallel so in this chapter we have covered a lot of concepts and a lot of things Uh, such as the silk route we have also seen the uh, kushana rules we have also seen the gandhar art and the mathura art why these places were important and we have also understood the basic uh, terminology about the bhakti and the how the initial developments of the uh, different deities were taking places and the also development of the temples right uh, what are the temples temples are the uh, the people out of love made the home for the deity so this uh, became the temple Right, and how the Christianity was also getting developed in the the uh, meantime. So all these things were happening. So uh, try to understand these concept, revise these concept, right? And uh, I will see you into in the next chapter. Till then, bye.